Fairbanks in the surrounding hills especially has fractured schist, fractured rock, which has very high concentrations of radon gas, especially in some areas. In this region, it's very common to install a radon mitigation system during new construction. If you're building in an area that has known high concentrations of radon, this is your single best chance to deal with it. And the cost of a system like this should be part, an embodied part of the cost of the house and an investment in the health of the occupants. As a guideline, we are going to be using Building Radon Out by the US EPA. It's got a lot of good general information as to how to install a system like this. What we are installing today is sometimes referred to as an active subslab depressurization system. And the word active refers to the fact that when this piping is installed, it will come to a central collection point where a riser will come out of the slab. And when this house is completed, we'll be installing a fan, an inline fan on top of that riser. So when that fan is running, it is actively depressurizing, sucking on that pipe and pulling any radon gas in the area under the slab or near the building perimeter into the perforated pipe and exhausting it safely either out of the roof or out of a sidewall. The issue at hand here though is the material in which we're burying the pipe. What we're working with as recommended by the EPA is a washed crushed rock with the majority of the rocks falling somewhere in between three quarters and half inch in diameter. What this type of material does is it has lots of air spaces in between the rocks and so you can very effectively allow soils gas to move underneath this slab to the collection points where you've got the pipe running underneath that slab. It just so happens in Fairbanks, what's available is high density polyethylene pipe, also known as HDPE. Now the issue with HDPE pipe is you cannot use typical plumbing glues for PVC on this type of pipe. It does, however, work because you're still using a PVC fitting. And so in this case, the PVC glue will soften this fitting and when you put it on this HDPE pipe, you can see there are many mild ridges on the outside of the pipe. If you use plenty of glue and squeeze the two together, that glue hardens up inside all these ridges and creates a secure enough mechanical bond that you have pretty good assurance this pipe isn't gonna come apart once it's installed in the ground. When you're installing this pipe, a typical pipe has holes that are close to 90 degrees apart, it's generally a good idea to orient one set of holes straight down. That way, if you should ever get any moisture inside this pipe, you don't end up with standing water, which could plug the pipe and cause some issues with mold inside the pipe. The main thing when you're selecting this type of PVC pipe is that it should have the compressive strength to be able to handle loading above it, such as dirt in a leach field, or in our case, under a slab. The EPA suggests that for any slabs or areas under 2,000 square feet, you can use either three inch or four inch drain pipe and anything between 2,000 and 4,000 square feet, you should upsize to four inch. I personally don't think you can go wrong with four inch. And in a case like this, even though our square footage is less than 2,000 square feet, we do have a significant number of 90 degree angles and other bends in the pipe. Every time you introduce a bend to the pipe, you reduce airflow. So given that the four inch pipe only costs a little bit more, I get a lot more peace of mind out of knowing that I can move more air through the larger diameter pipe. An unusual situation we ran into on this project is when we showed up, all of the under slab plumbing had already been installed. So here in this area, you can see a high concentration of risers for plumbing vents and plumbing drains. And so we were unable to run our collection pipe within one foot of the footing as we normally would. 
Here we have multiple penetrations through our slab and those need to be meticulously air sealed. But as a belt and suspenders approach, I felt it would be relatively cheap and easy for me to run a short stub of collection pipe into there to help depressurize that area. The idea behind this system is that it should run in a continuous loop around your footings and then it terminates at a riser. If one side or the other gets damaged, crushed, or plugged for any reason, you've still got the other side of the pipe where you can effectively de depressurize underneath your slab. Your riser should be securely glued in and it should be labeled and if necessary braced so that when the slab is being poured it can't be bumped, this joint can't be stressed, and everything stays secure. When it comes to installing an under slab depressurization system, the work done on the ground can be broken down into two critical parts. The first one we just covered, which is installing the depressurization piping at your collection tubing that's picking up the radon gas around the perimeter and as needed in the field. The second part, and is equally important, is your gas barrier membrane, and often it's also your ground vapor retarder. But you have to detail this extremely well you want to be absolutely sure that you're minimizing the number of penetrations through your vapor barrier. Six mil polyethylene sheeting is considered an industry standard as a vapor barrier material, including as a ground vapor barrier. If you're going to be in an area where you've got high traffic across your membrane before the concrete gets poured, or if long-term durability is more of an issue, then you could upgrade to 10 mil poly, it's a little thicker and a little stronger, or you could switch to either a 6 mil or 10 mil cross laminated polyethylene sheeting with reinforcing fiber woven in. It's both highly puncture and tear resistant. And another choice available to us locally is EPDM rubber. Local roofing companies carry this in stock. It makes a great gasketing material around plumbing penetrations through the membrane, and it can also be used as a liner underneath footings or around tub traps. Since we're working with an insulated concrete form system here, the nice thing is you've got a nice smooth surface where you can adhere your acoustical sealant. And so the way to do this is run your ground vapor retarder and gas barrier up over your footer, and I would say anywhere from two to four inches up above onto your wall. This way you are covering that cold joint between the footer and the base of the wall. That's a potential infiltration point. And as you can see here, it's a really good idea to have lots of slack so when the concrete gets poured, it doesn't pull this away. I like to depend on the acoustical sealant as my primary seal because I can get a really thick bead in there and press my plastic layers together and make up for irregularities. I think the red vapor barrier tape, as you can see here, it's very difficult to avoid having wrinkles, which are basically air pathways under this tape. It is good to use it, however, any place you've got loose poly where you've layered one piece over another. So anybody walking past before, before or during the slab pour can't lift one piece of poly from the other, or concrete can't squirt underneath there and separate the layers. So every place you've got overlapping plastic, it's a good place to put this vapor barrier tape and glue everything down, keep it secure. You'll want to be sure and plan ahead. So any place you've got tub traps or deeper areas in your pad where you're going to put in reinforced pads or strip footings, be sure and run your gas and vapor barrier underneath there so you can tie in and have a very continuous air seal. In this case, this was dug out after the poly was put in and the poly was cut out and then a patch was securely glued in place. When you've got penetrations in your barrier membrane here like we're seeing with this two inch plumbing vent, an excellent choice for a gasketing material to seal this long term is EPDM rubber. And what you want to find is a non-reinforced EPDM. It can be fairly lightweight. This is 45 mil EPDM roofing. 
it's flexible, which the reinforced stuff doesn't flex very well. But all I do is I cut a hole slightly smaller than the outside diameter of that pipe, and then it slides down and over. And as you can see, you've got a really good snug fit. And since EPDM is designed for roofing applications, it's got a really good durability and long-term flexibility, so you know that this will stay tight for pretty much the life of the house. Now when it comes to sealing, this is Tremco Acoustical Sealant, and you want to run a very generous bead right around the poly at the base of that pipe. And one thing here is we have two layers of poly. You want to cut away the top layer and seal to your primary boundary layer there underneath. So once I've got a very generous bead around the standpipe, I just slide my EPDM down, get it snug, and I can actually, I've got so much acoustical sealant here, I can actually feel it pressing in. And don't be shy about being generous here. We want a good long-term air seal, and you can see everything's very snug. It's a lot of peace of mind right there. The cost of this system here for about a 1,300 square foot house, the cost of the crushed rock, the uh, perforated piping, the uh, acoustical sealant, and the various sundries came out to less than $1,000. This is your single best chance and cheapest chance to deal with radon and it's very, very effective if done properly.